Welcome to Retro Course 17 and kicking off the show we got Contra for the Game Boy. Good old black and white Contra action. Or should that be good old yellow and white? Or yellow and black? Who knows? Who cares? Contra on the Game Boy is just as playable as the good old uh, Super Famicom Contra Spirits or Contra Wars or Contra 3 or whatever you want to bloody call it. Featuring a lovely selection of different types of weapons from homings to six way shots, lasers, and flamethrowers, you name it, it's got it. Graphically, especially for one of the earlier Game Boy titles, this is actually very nice. Sound wise, it does a fairly decent job at uh, presenting some uh, Contra based tunes. Could be a bit better, but you know. Not too bad. As well as having the standard uh, horizontal scrolling levels, we've also got the um, overhead views, which of course were also present in the Super Famicom uh, version. However, these uh, overhead views can be a little bit awkward, I think, because sometimes I find it a bit difficult to actually get past the enemies because the character seems to be a bit on the chunky side. Could be to do with a bit of a dodgy collision detection or whatever, I'm not too sure. But um, sometimes I do find myself finding it pretty difficult to get out the way of the bullets. But you know, it's not too much of a problem, I guess. Check that out, you got a bit of animation on the trees there in the background. Not bad at all. So altogether, yeah, Contra 3, or Contra I should say, is a very good game on the... Uh... Yeah, so altogether, Contra is a very, very good game for your Game Boy. Definitely worth picking up if you can find a copy these days. Legicore is very happy to give it the lovely score of 8 out of 10. Nice to load enough platformer, the only problem that spoils it. The only thing that spoils it though is the fact that you can choose what starting level you want to start on. It's a bit of a bum up. At least it doesn't have infinite continues, which is one good point. Turn 
rear section here for the Sega Saturn, otherwise known as Galactic Attack in the West, or Race Storm or Ray Force in the arcade. Actually, I think it's Race Storm. Available to play in Tate and Yoko mode. So we're going to be playing it in Tate mode, as you can see right now, which uh, once you've got your monitor tipped up on the side, it's going to look uh, backwards. But not to worry, because this game also features the option of changing your pad direction as well. So you can actually play it as a horizontal scrolling shooter. And it actually works very, very well. Actually, one thing that must be said about layer section on the Sega Saturn is uh, you play it in this mode, which we've got on now, which is a they call arcade mode, it actually has more special effects in it than it does in the actual Sega Saturn mode, which has most of the special effects missing out. Such as this nice little bit here where you zoom into the red planet. In this version on the arcade mode, it is actually a multi-layered parallax, but on the sound version it's just one bloody layer and it looks bloody awful. Look at that, beautiful. Why on earth the um, special effects aren't uh, present in the Sega Saturn mode, I don't know. Cause in the, all you have to do is uh, rotate the bloody image around. And let's say tight to actually reprogram the game. And uh, probably due to a uh, lack of uh, time, they've missed out half the bloody special effects. But, you know, not to worry, if you've got a TV which you can stand on its end, then, um, no worries. Just play an arcade mode, like me. So as you can see here in layer section, you have uh, two types of attack. You have uh, your standard uh, blast up, and you have a laser lock-on. The, the laser lock-on is actually used to hit items which are below you, such as a uh, spaceship zooming up in the background and so on. And here's a nice touch here, you can actually blow away the support to this island and it'll drop down to the ground. Watch this. Yeah, beautiful. So it is actually quite important to uh, use the laser lock on because uh, if you uh, actually destroy stuff while it's still in the background, you're going to save yourself a hell of a lot of trouble before it actually reaches the actual area which you are in. The layer section is definitely a game that really does show what the Saturn could do if programmed right, especially in such early days. Considering this is one of the uh, early shooting ups for the machine, it actually does have uh, 2D uh, effects far more uh, impressive than any of the latest stuff that came out on the machine. You know, it's jam packed for scaling, rotation, transparencies, and god knows what. Taito really did uh, do a good job, and the loading times on it are actually non-existent. You just gotta love that uh, soundtrack by Zuntada. But like many of Taito's uh, shooters, uh, layer section is gonna uh, have you pulling out your hair in frustration, because the game is not easy. Even on the normal level setting, there is no easy level setting. You're gonna find yourself absolutely fuming with their uh, rage, you know, due to the uh, sheer frustration of the uh, game. But the fact is, it's not actually that hard if you know where to go. The thing is, uh, it's that bloody much, uh, there's that much stuff going on at once, and uh, it just become actually quite confusing. In this lane age where most shooters seem to be guided through the laser bullet type shooters, uh, layer selection is actually quite a refreshing change. You know, maybe old and maybe a 2D sprite generated, but there's nothing wrong with that. The game still does hold its uh, ground e all these years later. Definitely one that you've got to check out if you've got a Sega Saturn, and believe it or not, it's actually one of the cheapest shooters out there for the machine. Guaranteed fun buster. Let's go, go and give it a score of 8 out of 10.
Holy shit, a Nintendo 64 game on Metro Core? What the fuck is going on? Actually, this is the very first uh, N64 game ever to be featured on uh, Retro Core. It's Hybrid Heaven from Konami, which can be played in normal resolution and high resolution. At the moment, you can see the high resolution screen, but what you can't really tell from this video is how fucking jerky it looks. Since the video misses out some frames. Anyway, we're going to play the game in low resolution because the game looks actually uh, pretty nice there. Well, the graphics look as uh, blurry as hell, but um, at least it's smooth. So yeah, the game kicks off with a lovely intro. And I've got to admit that I do think the introduction is uh, quite nice, to be honest. Yeah, the textures look as blurry as hell and everything looks like it's made out of uh, big massive triangle polygons. But you know, that's the style of the N64, isn't it? But the actual camera works not bad. Even though the acting is pretty bad, actually. So I should expect, uh, being from Konami, this game is going to be absolutely amazing and really, really good. Um, actually, far from it. The game is actually quite boring. So yeah, our main guy here, Jake, is uh, out to find out his true identity. And um, basically, throughout the game, he has to uh, go from one area to the next, uh, shooting targets with his uh, so-called uh, laser beam. It looks more like a water pistol to me. And uh, he uh, has to uh, communicate with uh, different uh, members of staff and so on to gain objects. And he can also uh, look in boxes such as here to find more objects, such as uh, energy replenishers or whatever. Um, as well as uh, being able to walk and jump, he can also shimmy across uh, platforms like you can see now. And he can also crawl on his uh, elbows. The problem with this game is that it's actually quite boring and um, most of the time you can just be walking from one area to the next without much to do. And um, another problem is the camera angles. Sometimes uh, the camera can uh, change to uh, some sort of weird obscure angle which automatically fucks up your controls. So no, one minute you're walking forward, the next thing you know you're walking backwards. Which can be quite annoying. Another really stupid thing Konami have done it's uh, these battles here. Now in a normal game you just push forward on the analog pad to run. But um, during the battles you've got to press the bloody Z trigger to run. Why the fuck change it? Uh, also the battles are actually uh, turn based options. So you don't actually get in there and punch the shit out of your opponents. You sort of have to uh, choose options as you just saw. Which is uh, I suppose it's a nice uh, change but uh, Maybe I would have preferred that we could actually get in there and uh, beat the crap out of the opponents in real time. One of the only uh, redeeming features about this game, as far as I'm concerned, is the audio. Being a cartridge game, it is actually quite impressive and quite atmospheric at times. But overall, I wouldn't uh, say Hybrid Heaven's got much going for it, to be honest. Except for this taxi driver's accent, it's fucking great. But today's Christmas Eve, it ain't Halloween, you know. I guess I do need to make a stop at a clothing store along the way. So while uh, Hybrid Heaven's not exactly shy of the month, uh, it's not actually uh, a very good game. So uh, RetroCore's going to give it the score of... 6 out of 10. So you in 64? was on the stage when he was attacked by a man but it turned out that the assailant was strangely enough none other than president weller himself wow quality of voice acting you gotta admit
Game of the Month, Metal Slug 2. For the Neo Geo CD. Mission 1, start! Smash Slug 2, one of my personal favorites in the series. Features absolutely superb animation. Some amazingly funny comical touches. And absolutely awesome playability. You're wearing a lovely awesome soundtrack, some beautiful artwork and you got yourself one hell of an awesome game. One thing which I've always loved about the Metal Slug series is the amount of uh, little details in there. Just have a look at this little guy here, the guy which you rescued doing fireballs. He even actually makes a sound as well. Many a time while playing Metal Slug 2, I've got myself killed by not paying attention to the actual game, but by, like, but by looking at the uh, actual graphical backgrounds. There's just so much in there worth seeing. As you can see, there's a little uh, dead mummified person down there at the bottom. There's always something going on in the background, such as uh, maybe little babies with bloody uh, machetes, <laughs> or you got bloody dogs and cats, uh, God knows what. It's always something to uh, keep your eye open for. One lovely feature which I love about this stage is um, when you get turned into the mummies. You get that beautiful little cloud of purple smoke. But actually once you're uh, turned into a mummy, uh, you don't actually get killed. Unless you get turned into a mummy for the second time. So it's sort of like an extra life I suppose. Or an extra chance. So here we got this great big motherfucking bloody um well I don't know what it is, looks like a bloody uh oversized digger. And our lovely uh metal slug army feel female has to uh, jump into a little uh tank here. Or tank mech suit. Blow the shit out of it. While avoiding that super sized laser as well. Stages in Metal Slug 2 are quite varied. Uh, as you can just see uh, before, as you just seen before, I should say, we would um, go vertically, but here we are going horizontally on a train. Later on in the game, we actually get to uh, ride inside an airplane as well. There are so many different vehicles which you can actually take uh, control of in that like to such as uh, mech suits, tanks, uh, and airplanes. Which all adds to the great playability of the game. Or the great variety in the playability, I should say. The game does have a few problems with slowdown, as you can see. But um, to be honest, it doesn't really bother you that much, and it doesn't distract from the actual gameplay. In fact, it sort of adds to it. Here we go, we got our airplane here and um, actually got a couple of nice uh, sexy uh, missiles as well. I'll just buy one at this tank, here we go. Yeah, that's the end of him. Another nice little feature which I like is if you actually eat too much food, the actual player goes pretty prompt. As you'll see in a second, she eats all these uh, Niku men, or dumplings, or whatever the bloody called in English. As she eats all these, um, she actually turns into a big fat bitch. Oh, she's just a snake there as well. There you go. 
Look at that, plumpy plumpy. Thank you. Heavy machine gun. First slug two isn't actually as hard as the first one, I think. Um, and there is an awful lot more going on, but um, I think the reason why it is a bit tough is because you end up spending most of the time looking at the background instead of uh, looking at where the fucking bullets are coming from. But um, overall, yeah, it's not actually as tough as the first game. That doesn't mean it's a walk in the park, though. It does have quite a challenge to it, but um, I think if you use all the continues which are available, you may just finish it on your first go, especially if you put on the easy level set. But anyway, it's Game of the Month, and Metrocore is very happy to give it the lovely score of 10 out of 10. And the first fall Mega Drive, just check out that wonderful soundtrack, Technosoft at the best. So kicking off the game you get a choice of the first uh, four stages, which you can choose in any order whatever, in uh, whatever order you'd like. So we're going to go straight to the first stage, which is straight. First thing you'll notice, the amount of amazing power like scroll in this game, it's got at least uh, 10 layers. The actual playing area in Thunder Force 4 is actually quite large as well. It's uh, in fact two screens tall, whereas most shooters are only one screen or one and a half at most. So it does actually give you quite a variety of um, in which uh, routes you can take throughout the game. Of course, you always get to the same end boss. But you can either take the lower routes or the higher routes. But uh, to be honest, I'd uh, think about taking both routes because you can miss out on quite a lot of power ups if you just take the lower routes or just the top routes. But here you can see the Sage 1 boss. And ah, what an ugly looking fucker he is. Guaranteed he's not gonna die easy. A very nice feature about the speed up on Thunder Force 4 is that you can actually do it in um, quarters. So you can actually go from 25 to 50, 75 to 100. But if you hold down, if you keep your finger held down on the button, you can actually increase the speed uh, <coughs> one by one. Just to give you that exact feeling which you really want. As you can see a lovely little uh, wormy type boss just popped out the sand, this is in fact the mid-level boss and here we got with the mid-level boss to uh, stage 3. Each stage consists of a mid-level boss and a final boss. Avoid those bullets coming in from the foreground. Some may argue that Thunder Force 4 is actually the greatest shooting map on uh, any 16 bit system. And I can actually see the point in that as well. I don't know you would actually say it is the best shooting map on any 16 bit system, but certainly one of the better ones, or is the best one on the Sega Mega Drive. Weapon wise, you got a choice of five weapons. You got the twin shot, uh, you got a back laser, you got a snake, and you got some sort of bloody uh, multi um, missile type thing and a homing missile. Of course, all the retards go for the homing because it's easier to get through the game that way. And of course, you got your option known as the claw. But as you can see now, our ship's going to get upgraded. And you'll be presented a 
lightning sword. This gives your ship a lovely little laser blast. Which you'll see right now here on the S stage. Look at that, beautiful. So, we're talking like 8 stages for Thunder Force 4. Definitely going to keep you going for a while, as long as you don't use the 100 lives cheat. As you can see, I'm not using it. And the soundtrack's legendary. Definitely the best soundtrack on the Sega Mega Drive. Better than uh, Beat uh, Burnacle 2 or Shooter Edge 2 in my book. Technosoft really know how to get the best out of the Mega Drive sound chip. So, RetroCore is very happy to give Thunder Force 4 and Sega Mega Drive a wonderful score of 9 out of 10. But even though uh, you got the game over, Technosoft have still kept a little bit of uh, entertainment in there for you. As you can see when you put your name in here on the uh, name entry screen, pushing left and right actually controls the stars. And if you push up and down, you can actually move the stars up and down as well. There you go, Technosoft keeping you amused to the very end.
I never really was into the Castlevania games when they first appeared. It wasn't until the Super Famicom Castlevania 4 came out that I really got into them. But I remember reading in the magazines such as Me Machines when they used to say things like the graphics are absolutely amazing and outstanding. And the first thing I thought when I put it on is what the fuck are they talking about? Because the graphics on the first level did look like a sack of shit. I'd seen much better stuff on my Sega Mega Drive and thought I'd be ripped off. But the more I went into the game, it sort of found out that uh, I got those lovely mode 7 effects, which really did make the game look that much better. But then again, if it didn't have the effects, it would still look like a sack of shit. Anyway, why are we talking about the Super Famicom version? Here we are with the original, which the Super Famicom is based on. And if it isn't, you could have fooled me, because lots of levels are the same. This is uh, Akumajo Jackala for the Famicom. Better known as Castlevania for this nest. Playability wise, it's pretty much the same as all the other Castlevanias. It suffers from the same bloody stupid problems as uh, walking up the stairs backwards. Um, sometimes you can't actually get stuck as you're walking up the stairs as well. One of the main problems is that you actually get to a staircase and you've got to push up and then character just gets stuck and won't move. Oh, and there's some other cases you go to whip, uh, throw at your whip and the little bastard just won't throw it out. Another slight problem, it's not too much of a problem on most levels, but uh, certainly on this level, as you can see, is the colour palette. Due to the uh, Famicom's limited colour palette, um, some stages, especially this one, are a little bit difficult to see uh, where you're going. See, the backgrounds and the actual main character are all orange. So they sort of blend into each other, especially if you're playing on a crappy looking TV. Luckily, I'm playing this through RGB, so it is quite uh, easy to work it out. But I did have a go of playing it off through uh, the RF or standard AV. It was actually quite difficult to figure out where my character was at, point, at some points. Another thing that really used to get to me about the Castlevania series was the fact that you can't actually hit up in some of them, especially this one. This made the game very, very difficult at times, such as avoiding enemies that were coming towards you in sort of a wobbly fashion, where uh, it was near impossible, due to the fact that you couldn't hit up, and also you couldn't actually move out the way fast enough due to uh, a main character being so fucking sluggish. I'm just being a picky bastard here at the moment. Actually, Castlevania and the Famicom isn't that bad, especially as far as uh, early platformers go. And this has some really decent tunes as well. And it's certainly nice to see uh, some of the earlier Castlevania games, just to see where the roots were came, just, just see where the roots came from. So I'm actually quite very happy to give Castlevania and the Famicom 7 out of 10.
卓越したイマジネーションが道を開く PC エンジンファイナルプラスター I used to love playing this one in the arcades years and years ago. It's Ninja Spirits by Irem. And actually the PC Engine version is extremely faithful to the arcade machine. Very impressive for such a small little tiny machine. So as you can see we just picked up a little power up there which gives us a nice little option guy who follows us around and does the exact same attacks. The game may look like it moves quite sluggish but um, to be honest that sort of sluggish feeling does actually go well with the game. It all feels nice to be able to flow through the air and uh, kill uh, enemies on the way down. Right now you can see that we're using some nice ninja stars. The characters do actually have a variety of weapons. You've got, uh, this is the katana attack which you saw just before, you got the ninja stars or shuriken here. Then you got a nice uh, sort of stick of dynamite which we're throwing out here which really does uh, take a lot of energy from the enemies. As well as that we've also got a nice little rope with a little hook attached to it. Which while is uh, nice looking, it's pretty, useful for it's pretty useless for killing enemies I should say. So here we've got the uh, stick of diamond, stick of dynamite. And uh, just watch out quickly, it uh, takes care of this uh, end of level boss here. See that? No challenge whatsoever. made quite a big deal about the audio on this game when it first came out, but I um, don't know why to be honest, it's not that special. It does have a nice beefy, beefy bass to it though, I'll give it that. So Retrocore is going to give the Ninja Spirits on the PC Engine 8 out of 10. Got it. 
Spider-Man. It's that time of the month again. It's Shire of the Month. And this month's Shire of the Month is Axel Brid on the Super Famicom. Now, while I've got to give Tommy credit for the actually trying something a bit different from the Super Famicom, they could have did it with a bit more uh, style. So, first you pick your robot and decide what weapons you want for each arm and what type of special attack you want. And then off to the game you go. Yeah, admittedly, yeah, it does look a bit blocky, but you know, it was a nice idea. So graphically, um, I will make this game shine the mountain as far as the graphics are concerned. And actually, I quite like the audio. I think it's pretty smart. But the way, the reason this is a uh, shadow month is because it plays like shite. And as you can see here, I'm next doing a couple of kicks and punches, but the actual uh, reflexes on these are so slow. It's like you're actually jumping in a bloody bowl of a uh, treacle or something. So that's why it's shite of the month. Next time, tell me, do your homework. So back when Street Fighter was really popular, Street Fighter 2 that is, everyone and their dog decided to jump onto the bandwagon and make their own 2D beat em up. And of course Atlas was no different and here's their effort, Power Instinct. While well, most of them are completely not a shite, and some of them were still shite but became really popular such as Bloody Mortal Kombat 1, suck of shit that was, but it was popular as hell. Anyway, uh, this one, Power Instinct, sort of uh, sat in the back of the game centers or the arcades, uh, not getting noticed too much. Along with a uh, Fatal Fury on the <laughs> Neo Geo, to be honest. But um, actually, it's not too bad. Uh, characters are big and beefy, and much bigger than what Street Fighters were. Uh, moves are a little bit basic, though. Uh, each character's only got like three moves or so. But of course, you got the uh, weak and strong punches and weak and strong kicks. No medium punch or kick in this game on a Street Fighter. And um, one of the ma major things which they did improve over the Street Fighter series was the actual backgrounds. They are actually animated a lot better. Uh, Atlas also added uh, quite a lot of uh, attention to the music, using an awful lot of uh, audio samples. There's even a bit of humour in there as well, such as this old granny, which I must admit is fucking tough as hell to beat. But anyway, she gives you a little kiss as you've just seen there, and uh, she turns into a young, beautiful lady. Or is, it, or is she beautiful? Well, where she is or not doesn't really matter because she's still going to kick your ass. Unfortunately for Power Instinct, uh, the game is extremely unbalanced. So like, the first few characters are really easy and then once you get up to this old woman here, or well, she's finished now, but once you get up to her, you'll find yourself getting your ass kicked in next to no time. The two little ninjas in the background you can see there are sort of like the referees. They don't actually do anything, just sort of uh, all around from side to side, as you can see there. Combo system and power instinct isn't that uh, great either. There are combos, but they um, don't really flow together too well. The game also available on the Sega Mega Drive and the Super Famicom. Actually, I prefer the Super Famicom version over to this arcade version, to be honest. I don't know why, but I just do. Actually, I think the Super Famicom version sounds better. So, RetroCore is very happy to give um, Power Instinct the RetroCore score of 7 out of 10. A pretty decent 2D fighter game. It's not going to uh, swallow up all your uh, coins, but, um, you know, it's worth a little blast. Yeah. <laughs> 
人と,とウエストの時間です。新宿時代は。はい So I'll start off this feature with a bit of action. Here we go with the Japanese version. And here you can see the English version. And as you can see, um, Sega very, very uh, wisely kept the speech all in Japanese and just subtitled it. Very good decision there. As you see some quality acting. Actually it's probably better than most of the Japanese TV dramas switch it on. So here we've got the title screen and this is the Japanese version again. And as you can see it's called uh, Shin Shinobi Den. Now the interesting thing is uh, here's the English version. And it's got the exact same bloody kanji, but the title's called Shinobi X in English. As you can see, the music's dif different as well. And I believe the uh, American version's called Shinobi Legions or something like that, but I've never actually seen the American version running, so I can't uh, confirm that. Back to the Japanese version. And the English version, and as you can hear, the music's completely different. And actually quite, quite a lot better than the English one. Okay, here we are in game level one, and did you see the nice little glitch just then? Play it back on slow motion and you'll see it. So while the music isn't too bad on the Japanese version for stage one, it is actually a lot better on the English version, as you can hear. All the music done for the uh, English version is by uh, Chris Jekylls. I think that's what his name was. Very talented guy worked for Sega Europe. Changed the music to quite a few uh, Sega Saturn games for the Western releases. But I must have to say that um, not all of his tunes are better in the English version of uh, Shinobi. Here we go, this is the Japanese version. And here's the English one. I just have to admit, I do prefer the Japanese tunes at this stage. Again, also on this stage, I do prefer the Japanese version. It seems to have a lot more atmosphere to it. So while this tune is pretty good, it does uh, seem a little bit too slow for the actual level. Gameplay wise, both games are exactly the same as far as I can tell. There's a Japanese version with a fucking awful song. And on comes the English version. With a much more catchy song. Yep, it's Soko Seito Kaiso on the console for the Sega Saturn. And as the game starts off, you get a little introduction here, like a bit of a news quest, telling you where the next fight's gonna be. And did you notice there was a little clock in the corner? Well, actually, it's in a real time, so you know what time I made this video now. Yeah, bloody early hours in the morning. Anyway, so as you can see, Summer Council is yet another 2D fighter for the Sega Saturn. 
Not like it needs another one. But you know, they're always welcome, especially if they're pretty good, like this one. Now one of the very nice features about this game, which I don't know if you can actually see on uh, the download version of the show, you should be able to see on the DVD version, is um, when you actually do a special move or whenever there's a high impact or something, you actually get uh, like a ripple effect on the background, sort of like a heat wave effect, you know when you sort of see the heat waves coming off the floor and everything in the background looks a bit distorted, well just like that, and it's actually very well done as well. I just hope you can actually see it on the download version of the show, which I'm not too sure you will be able to, to be honest. As well as that nice uh, background ripple effect, uh, you've got loads of transparencies in there as well, which uh, of course the sun can't do. As far as moves go, they are a bit basic, but uh, that does actually add to the way the game plays. Due to the basic uh, nature of the moves, it is actually quite easy to get combinations out. But actually, judging by my uh, playing skills here on this uh, video, <laughs> you'd think otherwise, to be honest. Each character has a total of two specials, plus a couple of extra special moves, which uh, are mentioned in the instruction book. So you have to learn them by uh, playing in the uh, training modes, which you'll see later on. In fact, uh, you'll see it right now, actually. So here in the training mode, you can um, choose uh, which character you want to go and which character you want to fight against. Uh, you can have them standing in different positions, such as uh, crouching or standing straight or jumping. I should be able to see right now. It is actually possible to pull off 12 hit combos, and actually I've seen uh, the computer do uh, pretty much uh, more than 12 hits as well. Actually 12 is the most I've been able to get going. Uh, you really do have to learn how to uh, control the characters and uh, master the moves and get the combinations to link together. It's not as easy as uh, Street Fighter is. But that's not to say that the combinations don't flow, it's just a matter of learning them. Altogether, Sonic Council is quite a refreshing beat-em-up. It's not exactly up there with the top boys from Capcom and SNK, but... You know, it is actually very playable. And um, it's definitely going to keep uh, Hard and Beat Mode fans uh, entertained for quite some time, especially with the combo system and all that in it. The actual characters used within the game are pretty nice. They could do with a bit more animation though, to be honest. But uh, overall, they're very quite, they're varied enough. So, uh, Retrico is very happy to give Soko Sei Tokai a lovely score of 7 out of 10. Not too bad. So because Manga Soko is on the other island of Japan, it's on uh, Kyushu, we've got to go through the uh, only tunnel which links the two uh, islands together. Actually, at the moment we're on Honshu, which is the main island of Japan. Same island, Tokyo and Osaka and all that's on. And as you can see, being the only tunnel through to uh, the other part of Japan, it's got a bloody traffic jam, which is nothing new. It's Japanese and their amazing way to think ahead. Let's make a tunnel with only one fucking lane going each way. I'll change it over here. But since that we're going nice and slow, you'll be able to see the nice little fugu fish. Better known as blowfish painted on the uh, outside of the tunnel. Maybe not. There you go, can you see them? Nice little fugu fish there, lovely. There come the lights on. Oh, 
Okay, so um, let's stop the video here and um, you can join me back in about 30 minutes when I get to Manga Soko. <coughs> Okay, so here we are, we're coming up to Manga Soko, better known as Comic Book Warehouse in English. Actually, it only took about 25 minutes to get here. As you can see to the uh, to your left coming up, we've got a big black building. That's Manga Soko, the mega old game retro maniacs. Yeah, this music is retro, isn't it? They kind of a look. There it is. Okay, so from here we're going to have a voiceover because um, I don't want to get spotted filming in a certain place. But oh, no fall over camera. There we go. Downstairs. Oop, there goes the camera. We go into the shop. One thing to always have while you're in Japan, especially in the winter, is one of these things. Get all the stuff to get trusty. There you go. Better lock the car as well. Just a quick look uh, around the area. You can see it's pretty much a residential area. And it's as windy as hell today. At least it's sunny. Okay, let's go in. So the first thing you come to when you get to Manga Soko in the game section is um, all the lovely hardware. As you can see here we've got a lot of Konami dance mats there. Big love here in a box set which I didn't actually notice while I was uh, in there filming. But I bought that if I did. And here we've got a lot of the Dreamcast VMUs. And a lot of the hardware units as well. Other goodies which you'll see just around the corner are Neo Geos and a couple of MSX consoles. All computers, I should say, as well as some uh, nice PC engines as well. There you can see accessories for the Super Famicom. If you ever need a pad or a B lead or power pack for any of your consoles, no worries when you come here. There's a nice Sega SG-1000 there. Okay, so here we are in the, uh, having a look in the glass case. In the glass case is where they put most of the uh, rare stuff, all the expensive stuff. Or at least according to them, it's the rare and expensive stuff anyway. So we've got the Famicom games there. Including the gold punch out cartridge. Some original copies of Mario 1 there. And here with, uh, we've got some uh, PC Engine and uh, Sega Saturn stuff. Yeah, look 
at that lovely nice tasty minty macros up there some mega drive stuff here such as the uh, contra hard corps is in there uh, the original fan star spot house 3 panorama cotton Battle Mania and all them, they're all in there. What the fuck Michael Jackson Moonwalk is doing in there, I don't know them. And here we got the uh, good old SNK stuff. look at some of the uh, more expensive Sega Saturn games here which is really weird because um, they've got Kiki Wing 2 in there and you board the downs out in the normal shelf and I could say the board the downs would be more rare than Giga Wing 2 so here you can see all the guidebooks right down to the very bottom wall guidebooks for all systems there and to your right you've got PlayStation 2 games, but we won't look at them because they're retro code, isn't it? PlayStation 2 is not retro. So down this aisle here, all the way to the bottom, you've got uh, PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 stuff. Some PlayStation accessories here. More books. And all the way down this aisle, we've got Sega Saturn. And more Sega Saturn here. And here we've got the Unboxed Super Famicom games. Absolutely thousands of them. And here we go to the Unbox Famicom games. Again, just like the Super Famicom, bloody thousands of them. More Unbox Super Famicom stuff. Nice power glove there, and um, the pretty rare Capcom power stick. Actually, they did have a Sega Saturn White, uh, Sega Mega Drive White one last time I was here, but uh, looks like it's been sold. In fact, there were quite a lot of missing when I took this video. And the week before, there was a shitload more stuff than what there is now. Here you can see an absolute, and yeah, here you can see a lot of uh, Famicom clones. And a couple of Famicom packs there, we can buy five games for a certain price. And a couple of Game Boy titles. Now one really nice thing that they do have here in Manga Soko is the uh, opportunity to buy instruction books all minty. Look at that. Super Famicom instruction books. Absolutely tons of them. And here we got the boxed Super Famicom games. And as you can see, there's a bloody load of them. Got to be something there for everyone there. Okay, 
Okay, this little table here where it's got 500 yen on it. It's actually a 5 mega drive game, so 500 yen. Uh, there isn't actually many here. Uh, last time I came, they were actually stacked up like 3 high. But, uh, looks like you saw quite a lot of them. More sand stuff there. And we've got PCFX and Neo Geo cartridges. And even 3DO's got its own shelf space here. Now that actually, uh, that the uh, director's cut has a sticker on saying Kizu, which means the disc scratched, but that's absolutely bullshit because I've bought hundreds and hundreds of, uh, well not hundreds and hundreds of games, but I've bought, you know, at least 80 games from this place that have had their sticker with scratch written on it, and not one of them was scratched. Just pure bollocks, unless it means the case is scratched. Okay, so here we've got the uh, PC Engine Super, F Super CD games, now just look at how many there are. There's fucking thousands of them. Well, maybe not thousands, but there's certainly a good couple of hundred. Yep, all that side, and all down this side as well. And they're not all just one crappy tile either, they actually got some really good stuff there. And of course, next to the PC uh, CD games, we've got the PC Engine Hue cards. And just them too. And of course, good old Mega Drive. Here you can see some MSX cartridges. And next to that, we've got some uh, each engine Hue cards without boxes. And next to them we got Mega Drive bo games without boxes. The weird thing is that some of these cost more than the versions with the boxes. Doesn't make sense at all that. And here we got some Master System Mark III games. And next to them we got some uh, Virtual Boy stuff. Good old Neo Geo Pocket. And of course you can't have a handheld section without a bit of Game Gear action. There are actually some Wonder Swans games as well which uh, unfortunately didn't uh, get filmed due to our staff being stuck in that section all the time. Here we can see some Famicom Disk system games. Selection here. I wonder how many work though. And Sega Dreamcast. There isn't actually that much uh, stuff for the Dreamcast because um, all the ho all the collectors are hoarding all the games here in Japan. But that's not to say you still can't find some good deals, as you can see here. We got a Chaos Field here. We've got Gigawing. A Della Jet Set Radio, which I bought, and uh, we got Border Down as well. Some Mega CD stuff here. Well, Shana, of course, CD. Now, here's one thing that bloody puzzles me. They got a uh, Luna here. And let's look at the price of it. It's almost 10,000 yen. Yeah, 
if you ever wanted to see uh, a lot of the limited edition Game Boys together, this is the place to come. You got the Hatter one there, the Zelda one, you got uh, the original like, Famicom one from uh, the Club Nintendo, and uh, absolutely shitloads of uh, Pokemon varieties. I don't mind that Donkey Kong though. There were actually some N64 stuff which I filmed, but um, for some reason it didn't appear on the tape. That's possibly um, I didn't press the record button in properly when I was filming them sections. So not only does uh, Manga Soka have a lot of uh, games, it's also got books, uh, clothes and electronic stuff. But they've also got an arcade which is completely free, yeah. Completely free, retro gaming. As you see as we just go around the corner, past all these uh, comic books. Got stuff like Outrunners in here. Beat Mania, Para Para Paradise. That's a good stuff, I'm good for So I hope you enjoyed um, today's trip to Soko Man uh, Manga Soko and uh, personal buyers. Today we've got a Jet a Dera Jet Set Radio, which is the limited reprint in uh, Japan, featuring all the stuff that's in the American and European version. We've got Advanced Wars there for the Dreamcast as well with a special guidebook. And we've got a couple of Sega Saturn tiles as well. So, no complete waste after all. So. Hope you enjoyed it, and you never know, may come back in the future.